last week and this week. Did Andy tell y'all to do something? <laughs> I want all of y'all to be seated for just a second. I want you to find your place in Philippians chapter 2. And I wanted you to be seated because I want you to see a person I want to recognize. All right, where's Debbie? Why did ting, ting, ting. There, I'm sorry. There you are. Uh, their son, Bradley, is one of our military guys. He's getting ready to be deployed to Afghanistan in a little while. Today is his last day in church before he's going to be going. And his wife, Blair, also, I uh, want to pray for them and also his unit. Uh, Bradley, if you don't mind, would you stand up so we can see who you are? And guys, appropriately thank our military. Thank you, Bradley. Thank you, Blair. And thank you for their unit. Man, it is so encouraging for me uh, to walk around in freedom. Without, without a worry in the world, to walk around in freedom because we have our military guys, we have our police, we have all the people that protect us. And uh, I want you to know that we appreciate it. And I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. Uh, but I want you guys to open up your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. I have such a good word to share with you this morning. I really believe that God has blessed this and anointed it, and there's so much we need to tell you. And so Philippians chapter 2, if you don't mind, would you give honor to the reading of the Word of God and stand with me? If you can. If you can't, that's okay. Remain seated. Don't worry about it. Uh, and if you can. Verse 1 of Philippians chapter 2, Paul says this. He says, Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, then fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and of one mind. This whole thing is about Christian unity. He says, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let nothing, or I should say, let each one of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and taking on the form of a bondservant, and coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven, of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Pray with me. Father, I want to thank you today for the blessings you've already bestowed upon us. Thank you in the previous two services for those who gave their heart for the first time to Jesus Christ. Lord, may you continue to richly bless their lives. And I look forward to a total change in their, not only their destiny, but in their living because of who you are. Father, I want to thank you for Bradley and many others like him, his unit and all the guys and gals that are protecting us, but specifically him today. I want to thank you for him, for his wife Blair, as I know that it's difficult whenever uh, any time a spouse is separated, just the mere separation becomes a challenge. But I thank you for his bravery. I thank you for his loyalty to this country and to protect those of us who some may know him, some may not, some may agree and some don't. But that is the height of the honor that it takes to serve in this country that you protect all people. And so I thank you for that. Keep him, his unit, and all of our military men and women safe. Uh, be with Blair in, with, as he's gone away. And I do lift up Debbie and Alan, as I know that uh, sometimes whenever we're younger, we think about ourselves and our spouses. But boy, as moms and dads, it's really hard to measure the love, the concern, and the care. And so I pray for them as well. Now, Father, will you have your will and way in this hour and bless us and let us be a blessing to you in Jesus name amen you may be seated oh man you guys have worshiped today thank you for that I want to speak to you 
for a few moments on the subject, the right mind. I have way too much to share, so I'm going to cut a little bit here and go straight to the point. In, a, in two weeks from now, we will have our Easter services. There'll be some adjustment because of crowds that will be here, and so we'll change some uh, Sunday school and stuff like that. Just be looking in the bulletin for it. You'll hear it next week. But, but in two weeks from now, we have an opportunity that only comes around once a year, and it comes to our church and every other. And that opportunity is there are some times when uh, folks are going through a, a, a challenge in life or struggles in life, even if they're challenged with the faith or struggles in the faith, there's at least one time of the year that folks will say, maybe I should go and, and I just want to go to church this week. And we really hope that they will come here and, and all other places. And if they do, then we want to be prepared for them. We want to make sure that we're here to help them. And the greatest help we can offer is to help them come to faith in Jesus Christ. One of our hope, hopes and prayers is that you will pray with me that we would be able to see 100 people come to faith in Christ. Now, we started early. We decided we'd start early. So this morning, a guy came to me and he said at the 8 o'clock service, said, I'd like to be number one. And he was. He was number one. At the 930 service, a young lady came to me with two children. She said, could I be number two? Yes. It's okay if we start early. Maybe somebody in here wants to be three, four, five, six. If there's a hundred, we'll, t we'll even be willing to go over if that's what it takes. We're happy to do that. And so it was very, very encouraging this morning to do that. Now, here's our goal. Our goal is to say, if God's going to bless us with folks that will come, how can we best take care of them? And not just for one day of the year, but could this be a launch date for us to do as good as we can every day of the year, every Sunday? So I want to talk to you about this church at Philippi. Paul came to this church because the church at Philippi was a unique church. It was full of the absolute confidence in God while simultaneously being filled with conflict among the people. And as a result, they had this desire to serve God, but a challenge because of their conflict and their witness for the Lord and their reach to the world had ceased. Paul saw that they were going into a little bit of a rut, and he wanted to help pull them out of this rut because here's what happens sometimes. When we are lost, and I remember being lost, I was in the world and I felt fine. Honestly, I felt fine. If my wife hadn't nagged me and bugged me and pushed me and drugged me and done all manner of evil against me, I wouldn't be here today. Okay? So it wasn't like I was looking. But nonetheless, she, she drew me here. And, and as she did... I finally, long story short, I finally came to faith in Christ. Whenever I did, and as I started to grow in the Lord, I, I started changing the way I thought. I started changing the way I lived. I started changing the people I hung out with. I started changing a whole lot of things, which was all awesome. It was all good. But guess what happened over a course of time is that as I grew more in Christ, the chasm that started to grow between me and my ability to understand those who didn't know Christ also expanded. And there came a point where it expanded almost to the point that I had nothing to say to them and they had no connection to me. It can happen. It really can happen. And what happened in the church at Philippi, that's exactly what happened. These folks were pagan when they were saved. They began to grow. They became a very encouraging church to Paul. They were the first church that Paul planted on the uttermost soil. And they grew very rapidly. But then their, their growth ceased because the more they knew about Jesus, the more suddenly they began to realize how different they now were from the world. And unfortunately, what can happen to you is the more that you walk in Jesus, the more capacity that you have to feel like possibly we're a little bit better than the world. Let me ask a question. The law of God has a purpose. Galatians tells the purpose. Romans tells the purpose. The law is to make us aware of our sinfulness. Right? Is that right? So here's basically what the law tells you. You're a sinner on your way to hell in need of Jesus. That's what the law tells us. You are a sinner on your way to hell and you need Jesus. That's what the law says before you're saved. There's a possibility that after we're saved, we start hearing the law differently. 
where the law told us that we were sinners on our way to hell in need of Jesus, now the law, the way we're interpreted, all of a sudden becomes, I'm better than you. How did that happen? How did the law that says you're a sinner, like every other person in the world, on your way to hell, like every other person in the world, in need of Jesus, like every other person in the world, suddenly say, I'm better than him. I don't do this, and I don't do that, and he does, and she does this, and I'm better. How does that happen? But it does. It does. And when that happens, we lose connection, and we lose perspective, and pride comes in, and a lot of stuff comes in, and individualism starts to take over, and then we stop doing what God's asked us to do. Paul combats this in the church at Philippi, by sharing with them the example of Jesus Christ. So in Philippians chapter 2, in the first three verses, or the first two verses, he basically says this in a very convoluted way, but he's basically saying, you know what? There are some great things in the faith. There's peace in the faith. There's love in the faith. There's Christ in the faith. There's joy in the faith. And, and because there is, there's ways to get that. It's not that you got to have this to get to the faith, but the faith produces this, and so we want it to produce that. But in order for it to produce that, there's some things that are necessary. And they deal with a right mind. Let me give you two things that a right mind is this morning. Number one, a right mind is a humble mind. To have the right mind, because God, Paul wants the church at Philippi to, to not get prideful and not get individualistic, but to get unified so they can go back to the business of reaching people like God called them to do. But in order to do that, there's going to have to be a mind change. And the right mind is a humble mind mind. Now let's take a look at what Paul said about a humble mind. We find it mostly in verses 3 and 4 and you'll see there that basically he said three things about it. A humble mind, number one, is not self-promoting. It is not self-promoting. Now he says I don't, let, 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 listen, verse 3 let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. Very quickly that just means uh, self-ambition is electioneering. Uh, you know, voting for yourself. And conceit could be that I, I don't see myself probably the best way that I should. So let's not do anything from our own particular mindset. It's not self-promoting. And I'm going to quickly through this so I can spend some time on the end. But then secondly, it is also the, the, the humble mind sees the value of the body. And I need to give you a little understanding of this. He says in verse 3, But in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. I don't give you a lot of language anymore, but I'm going to give you some language this morning because it's important because, there, because there's two different words that is used in two different verses, and I need them to cut against each other so you can feel it, okay? Now, this, this particular passage in, in Greek is very clear, well, mostly clear. In English, it's not. When you hear, let, we want each one of you to esteem others better than yourself, here's what it sounds like to me that I need to sort of put myself on the back burner and not pay any attention to myself at all, and then I need to value this person far above me. That's not what it says, okay? That's not what it says. Let me give you a word. When he says he wants us to esteem, that word is value, and that's not the word, but he says, I want you to esteem others. The word others is the word alalone. When I give you the other word, you'll understand, but for now, it's the word alalone. And here's what it translates, one another, okay? It translates one another. And he uses the word for each of you as hekastos, which simply means each and every. So he's speaking of us as singular individual units. He'd like me calling out every single one of the names across here to say, I want each and every one of you to think this way. Okay? So he uses the word alone, which means one another. There's a very big difference in me saying we ought to be concerned about others and we ought to be concerned about one another. Right? You feel that? Here's how it really translates in a way that could be written. Paul is saying this. Here's how I want you guys to do it. I want you guys to have a value in your mind that all of us together are more valuable than one of us alone. That's what he's trying to say. All of us together carry greater value and ability than one of us alone. 
That doesn't mean that God values each of us differently or less than the other. It means this. In the context of a church, because he's writing to a church, God has gifted each one of us in varied ways. I have gifts and you have gifts. Yours are different than mine. Mine are different than yours. And if I'm the only one doing anything, then this is a very one-dimensional church. And it has a, it's very, very limited in anything that it's doing because I'm the only one doing anything. So we need to understand that not, I wish I could be the pastor. Uh, we don't need to wish that. We're the body. And as the body together does all the stuff the body's supposed to do, the body will produce greater output than a singular individual. So Paul says, the first thing I want you to get is that a humble mind is going to recognize the value of the whole body over and the need of the whole body over the singular individual. Y'all remember that, don't you? Spock. <laughs> the needs of the many overrule the needs of the one. That's for all you Trekkies. For the rest of you, forget it. Sorry. Okay? So that was, we understand that. Number three, though, number three, Paul said there in verse four, that a humble mind is going to seek a redemptive connection to the lost. Not just a connection, a redemptive connection. That means a connection where we recognize the need that they have. And here's how he says it in verse 4. He says, let each one of you look out not only for your own needs or your own interest, but also for the interest of others. So two, two things he says there. First of all, we get to maintain our own identity. He didn't say, throw yourself away, pay no attention to yourself, you don't have any needs, uh, God's done with you. That's not what he said. He said, look not only on your own interests, so it's okay to have need. It's okay to be a part. It's okay to feel. It's okay to ask. It's okay to accept some things. We maintain our identity. But he says, I also want you to look out on the interests of others. And here's the other word. The word is heteros. That word is cut against the alelon. Notice that in your English translation that both say others. And if you didn't see the original language, you probably never picked that out. But it is there in the original language. And so he says, one another, all of us together, need to realize that all of us together have great power to help those that are others. The word heteros could be used, a lot of our English language has Greek roots and forms in it. And so we have heterosexual. I am a heterosexual. I am married to a woman, which is somebody other than I am. If I was an all alone and it was used in that context, then it would be the same. He says, I want you guys to not only, look, now listen, whenever he says, look out for your own interest, he wasn't talking about an individual. He was talking about the whole church. Church, I don't want you looking out only for the interest of the church. I want you to realize that the whole church has greater potential than one individual. And I want you to look out for the interest of this church. But not only the interest of those of us in this church. I want you also to look out on the interest of those that are not part of you. That are other than you. That are different than you. And in context... He's talking about the lost world because their witness has stopped. Their witness has stopped. And that's the premise of this whole passage. Look not only on your own interest, but look also on the interest of others. That is the whole premise. So we need to take care of you, but we also need to reach out there. And you need to engage with us because we need all of you. So that's the premise. Now here's the question. How can we take on that mind? We have to have the mind first that's humble enough to say, okay, I, I, think, I, I think I've got it. It's not just about me individually. It's a body. And it's not just about the body, but the body has been put here to reach others. I got it. But I don't necessarily think that way. What kind of mind do I need? And so in verse 5, he says, now, here's how you're able to think this way. You are going to have to let the mind be in you. That is also in Christ Jesus. Now the, the, the literal translation would be think the thinking of Jesus. That's the literal translation. Think the thinking of Jesus. Not think like Jesus. Think the thinking of Jesus. You can't really write it that way because we wouldn't understand it, But that's what it says. Think the thinking of Jesus. 
Now, how do we do that? He gives four things that Jesus did. Now, here's how I want you to see this, okay? This passage, I don't even have a right to stand up here and share it. Of all the passages of Scripture in the entire Bible, in my estimation, this is the number one. This is the deepest. This is the one that, that no man can truly even scratch the surface of the depth of what this passage says. And, and, and when it comes in terms of the incarnation of Jesus Christ and how that all worked out and how he's the God and man and how he laid down and how he emptied himself. There's not a man on this planet or a woman on this planet or anything on this planet that can truly express the depth of this passage. So I realize that I am way in over my head. However, I can swim, so I'm keeping my head above water. I'm just staying on the shallows. Here's, here's what I will say. If you ever go try to read this behind in some commentaries, it'll bury you. It'll absolutely bury you because every, every theologian focuses on how did Jesus do these things. That's not what the passage asks us to do. The passage says, hey, guys, when you first got saved, you did great. And then you got a little prideful. And then you got a little argumentative. And when that happened, you got very divided. Now, here's what I need you to do. I need you to reunite. And I need you to be unified and get back to business. And the business is reaching people for Jesus. I need you to do that. Now, here's how you do it. Here's the thinking that you need. He didn't say, figure out how Jesus became the God man. That's not what he said. He said, let this thinking that Jesus thought be your thinking. So here's what I want to do. I want to tell you what Jesus did. And then I want to look at the thinking that had to be behind it. Okay? What did he do, and then what was the thinking that had to be behind it? Let me give you a, a very quick illustration to help you understand. On uh, 91101, y'all remember that, right? Uh, there were a number of personnel, professional people, uh, rescuers and stuff like that, that while people were rushing out of the towers in New York, the rescue people were rushing in. Even when those towers, they knew they were coming down, they... We're rushing in. Uh, Bradley is going to Afghanistan. Why would anybody? I don't choose to vacation in best Afghanistan. I'm not rushing to Afghanistan. In fact, I would be rushing out of Afghanistan. And yet he's going. Now, here's the question. What kind of mind, what kind of thinking does it take to go into danger as opposed to going out? What kind of thinking does it take to move away from what's really comfortable into what is uncomfortable. What kind of thinking is that? And this is what Jesus did. So let me give them to you. Number one is his pre-incarnate decision. Now I know you're like, oh, what does that mean? We all know what incarnation means. You've heard, you've heard it in secular ways, okay? And that is this way. I was watching a movie and they were talking about reincarnation. See, you know what it is, right? What is reincarnation? Someone died, their spirit's hanging out here, and they are born again into a, another body. So it's a spirit that goes into a body. The incarnation of Jesus is the spirit of Jesus going into a body. But now, prior to that happening, in his pre-incarnation, something had to happen. And I want to tell you what Jesus did. Here's what he did. He volunteered to redeem mankind. This is what he did. Let me try to express it to you. In verse 6, he says this. Who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery... To be equal with God. So there's some calculations that's going on in Jesus' mind. Some things that he's doing. Let me try to express to you exactly what he is doing. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 4 through 7, I'm just going to read them to you. The Bible says this, and here's the conversation. It is a conversation just prior to Bethlehem. Jesus is in heaven. The Son of God is in heaven. And he is getting ready to step into a body that, Christ has, that God has prepared for him. But he has a conversation with God before he does it. And we have it recorded for us in Scripture in Hebrews chapter 10. And here's what it says. It says, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Now think about this. For 1,500 years, they have been going through the temple service of sacrificing bulls and goats. And Jesus comes and says, uh, for all of heaven to hear, here's something that I'm aware of. It is not possible... That what the Jewish faith has been doing, what Judaism has been doing for the last 1,500 years, it is not possible 
to remove sin from mankind. So we've got an impossibility here. He says, as a result of this, here's what he says. Therefore, since it's not possible, when he came into the world, speaking of Jesus, he said, sacrifice an offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, behold, I have come. It is written of me in the whole of the book to do your will, O God. Here's what Jesus did. He said, in his pre-incarnate state before he ever came, he had to decide whether he wanted to be involved in the redemption of mankind. And he had to do it willingly. And he comes and he said, you know, there's, there's really no way that this whole religious system that's going on is ever going to be effective. It was just to be a representative, but it was never to be effective. It was representative so that I could come. And I've got to decide whether I'm going to go down there and suffer the cross and, and die to pay for sin. I'm volunteering to go. Okay, that's what he did. What is the thinking behind it? That's the thing. What is the thinking behind it? Let me tell you, the thinking is found there in verse 6. The thinking behind it is this. He was secure in his identity with God. Listen to verse 6. He says, he, came in the, he was in the form of God. And he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. This is a big passage. Let me try to explain it. Here's what he's basically saying. I'm God and all of heaven knows it. This is Jesus speaking. I'm God and all of heaven knows it. And they know it because I wear the regalia of deity. Because everywhere I go, everywhere I walk, everywhere I am, they can look at me and see that I'm God. There's no question about it. Now, if I were to take the robes and the garments of deity off, not deity itself, but the robes of deity off, am I still God? If Jesus laid down the robes of his deity, is he still God? Well, yeah. Nothing that he does ever stops him from being God. So Jesus was so confident in his own identity as God that it was okay for him to lay down the things that physically might manifest him to others as God because it didn't remove his godness at all. You got that? Let me, let me give you an example. There's a, there's a show on television that's called Undercover Boss. You ever seen that? It's, a, it's, a, it's where highfalutin bosses will step down into their lowfalutin jobs and come meet with their, uh, you know, nobody employees only to find out those nobody employees were really somebodies and they didn't realize how awesome they really were. Now, here's the thing. The boss may be wearing Gucci suits and he may drive a Rolls Royce automobile and he may have on a Rolex watch and a gold ring. And so he's like, well, if I'm going to go down there and I'm going to try to relate to my employees, I'm going to have to take off my Gucci suit. I'm going to take off my ring. I'm going to put down the Rolex watch and get me a Timex that's a digital it's three dollars, and and I'm going to take off uh, my shoes and put on some tennis shoes, and maybe mess my hair up or something like that. Now here's the question: When he took all that stuff off, did he cease to be the boss? No. He's totally confident in the fact that he's the boss. Well, Jesus was totally confident that he's God, so he did not feel like hanging on to being God was something necessary. See, one of the things that we challenge, we're challenged with is that we're very fearful that whatever we might choose to do to reach the lost is that people are going to say, well, I thought y'all was Baptist church. I had a lady the other day ask me, what are y'all? And I said, well, we're the church. We're a church. And, and here, listen to the response. Well, well what kind of church? And I'm like, we're God's church. And in a continued conversation, listen to this, in a continued conversation, and see if it's not true among us. We know what a Baptist church is. We know what a Methodist church is. We know what an Episcopalian church is. We know what a Presbyterian church is. We know what a charismatic church is. We know what the Catholic church is. We know what the Lutheran church is. But we don't know what the church is. We know man's definitions. We just know what the church is. And sometimes we're afraid. 
Well, if I do that, that's not like being uh, what I am. Oh, it's okay. It's okay. You know what I'm confident of? When Jesus saved me, I'm a son of God. Nothing changes that. You guys may say, Pastor Kenny's a moron. He's still a son of God. And you can't change it. You, you can't undo that. Well, uh, I don't want to spend eternity in heaven with him. Too bad. Too bad. I'm going. I'm going. No matter what, I'm going. And if you're saved, so are you. So are you. And be careful because I don't know this would happen. But it could be if, if we're like the Philippian church and we're kind of not unified, God might make you spend next door to me for a million years or me next door to you for a million years till we learn how to get along. You want some of that? <laughs> <laughs> might be a challenge. I was like, I got it, God. I got it. I'm good. So he was confident. That's what he did. Number two, number two, quickly, I want to talk about his incarnation. So he, he's able to let go. And in his incarnation, let me tell you what he did. He unclothed himself of the garments that identified him as God. And he clothed himself with the garments that identified him as man. So Jesus said, I'm going to take off the stuff where people would see me as God. And now I'm going to wrap up myself in human flesh. We can tell because on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Bible says he kind of peeled back his flesh, let Peter, James, and John uh, see who he was. And you know what's the challenge? Every time somebody saw God in Scripture, you know what they did? They fell as dead. Like they saw him, fell as dead, fell as dead, fell as dead, fell as dead. I think Jesus probably had a conversation with the Lord, about, with God the Father, saying, I, I can't go down there looking like this. They all die around me. <laughs> I've, got, I've got to do something different. And so he pulled flesh on. And in pulling that flesh on, he's like the undercover boss. And it's not like he's trying to be undercover, but he's trying to uh, relate. And so he lays that down. And this is what the Bible says. He didn't consider Robert to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. That word is echinosin in, in Scripture, and it's the great canonic passage, and it means to empty. It doesn't mean that he's no longer God. It simply means that he laid down some things that would open, outwardly manifest him as God. Now, can you imagine the challenge that Jesus would have to say, everybody's known that I'm God, and I'm getting ready to go do some things and, and show myself in ways. They're not even going to recognize me as God, but I'm still God, so it's okay, and I know what I'm trying to do. That's what he did. What is the thinking behind it? What is the thinking behind what Jesus did? The thinking behind it is this. A connection had to be made that would relate to man so that man could be saved. How do you... What if you had students here? And like, it's student night and we're serving up, uh, we're serving up a goat cheese salad and uh, we're going to have some caviar over there and uh, uh, some roasted sheep eyeballs. Uh, see, I, I just don't think that they're coming. You know what I mean? I just don't think they're coming. But I say, pizza. Yeah, we can have some pizza, right? Hot dog, pizza, hamburger, ice cream, stuff like that. That just relates. That's all. And, it, and I'm, no, I'm no less uh, Kenny or no less a Christian if I'm trying to relate to somebody. Because here's the deal. I've got to be able to connect with them. And we're so accustomed to this, right? One, one great challenge I had was when Apple decided to change the connector on their phone from that big fat daddy to that little one. Remember that? Anybody with me? Yeah. I got all these little fat connectors around. It's like, well, it's an Apple phone, but it don't connect anymore. So what good is it to me? It doesn't connect anymore. And I and also wanted one of those iHome uh, clocks where you could stick your phone on well guess what it, uh, so you know what we needed you had to buy a little adapter and what did the adapter look like it had a big fat one on one side and a little small one on the other side so that it could take two things that didn't connect and make them connect guess what jesus is he's the adapter i'm god i'm man i'm god i'm man he's the adapter that's the thinking behind it. I've got to be able to grab onto God's hand and I've got to be able to grab onto man's hand to pull the two together. I've got to be able to do that. That's the thinking behind that. We've got to figure out how to do that. Number three, I want you to see that his ministry in culminating in Calvary, what did he actually do? So he's made the decision to come redeem mankind. He has now stepped into a body in Bethlehem and now his ministry is going to be a challenge. Guess what he did? Jesus violated religion. That was the act 
of what he did. You know he made everybody mad. Did you know that? Jesus made everybody. They killed him. How much matter can you get to somebody than to kill them? They killed him. How did he make them mad? Well, he violated everything about religion. He violated the laws of the temple. He violated the laws of the Sabbath. He violated the laws of Moses as interpreted by the religious people. He really didn't violate any, but our interpretations of those things, he violated those interpretations. God forbid he ate with sinners and tax collectors and publicans. And he claimed himself to be God. And as a result of that, they killed him. They killed him. That's what he did. Now, here's the question. What is the thinking behind that? What kind of thinking is there behind that? Here's the thinking. Jesus came to meet the needs of the lost, not the needs of religion. He just said, let's see, the blood of bulls and goats... Cannot take away sin. Sacrifice and offering you had no pleasure in. If you could see how the scriptures are written in a very distinctly Jewish fashion, you would understand that those two metaphors are for the entire Jewish system. The entire sacrificial system. The temple, priests, sacrifice, everything. Before he ever came here, he said, it's not even possible. It is not even possible. It will not take away sin. It will not take away sin. Therefore, I am not going down there to affirm religion. I am not going down there to affirm anything that doesn't have the desired result. I'm not going to affirm it. So I've got to come down here and show them that what they're doing, though obedient, is not effective. That there's a change. So I've got to show that. So whenever he came down here, he's going through the grain fields and his disciples are plucking heads of grain. And they're like, mmm. When I was a kid, we used to go, oh, chop, 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 chop. Somebody's getting in trouble. I can see them now, the Pharisees. Oh, (laughs) we got you now. Wait till we tell God. You know that's got to be funny to Jesus. Wait till we tell God. Well, tell him. He's my daddy as I he knows. So he, he, he shared with them, listen, that's, that's not how it works. That's not how it works. That's not how it works. And he, he spent his time irritating people. He's in the synagogue, and he's like, hey, let me ask you guys a question. Is it all right to heal on the Sabbath day? Is it? Get up. Is that all right with y'all? <laughs> now, a guy that's been paralyzed his whole life gets up, and he's walking around. And they're like, you did that on Saturday. And you're like, did you see that guy running around? I think y'all must have missed something. Like, you did that on Saturday, brother. Mm. Can't have that. That's what he did. What's the thinking behind it? I already told you, he came to fulfill the needs of the lost. Listen, look at this passage of scripture in Mark. When the scribes and Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, and he said to his disciples, how is it, how is it that he eats and drinks with tax collectors and sinners? I'm not sure what the difference between a tax collector and a sinner is, (laughs) but whenever I found out how much I had to pay to the government this week, I became more aware of that sin. (laughs) When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well, listen, I made this really big, Those who are well have no need of a physician. There's a reason I'm not in the hospital today. I don't need to be in the hospital today. There's a reason I'm not scheduled for surgery tomorrow. I don't need surgery tomorrow. I am well. I don't have that need. But for those people that are sick and need it, Jesus said, I have come because those who are sick do need a physician. But those who are well do not. Can I tell you something? In the context, when Paul said, hey, for all of you believers that are out here who are already saved, you don't have need of salvation because you already have it. And you can't lose it. But there are people that do. And Jesus came when you needed him, he was there. And now that you're in, don't think that he's not there for somebody else. He has come to meet the need where the need is. And the need is that people are dying going to hell. They really are dying going to hell. He says, I've come to meet that need. And then finally, number four, I want you to see what God did in his exaltation. 
Not Jesus, but God. God highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess of those in heaven, of those on earth, of those under the earth, that Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. We've all heard that, right? Let me tell you what it is. What's the thinking behind it? It is public affirmation of what he just did. Is public affirmation of what he just did. If you go back to the Old Testament system, here's what you'd understand. When the priest would go into the Holy of Holies to give sacrifice for the whole nation, all at one shot, when he went behind that veil, they had bells tied on him so they could hear him walking around. If he did anything wrong, he would die. So they had to tie a rope to him because they couldn't go in. Only the high priest could go in. And if he died, they'd have to drag out his dead body. But if he came out... It meant that God had accepted that sacrifice and the people of Israel could say, man, for a whole year, we're good to go. When Jesus died and he was resurrected, it was God saying, I accept the sacrifice. You're all forgiven. It was an affirmation that his stepping down to a low and humble state that is stepping into a body to associate and connect with mankind, even though he was not trying to connect to the God side, he was trying to connect to the man side. See, the church might have it a little bit different. We, you know what people feel like? People feel like, I can't come to church until. Until what? Until I get my life in order. Until I stop sinning. Until I quit drinking. Until I get off of drugs. Until I'm past this depression. Until my divorce is final. Until I get right with my parents. And until, until I'm fine with myself. And God said, hold it. Hold it. No, no, no. No. The Bible says we have a high priest that can be touched with our infirmities because he has been tempted in every way that we have been tempted, yet without sin. He's saying, no, 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 you don't understand. I died for you while you were a sinner. I'm coming to you in your depression. I'm coming to you in your alcoholism. I'm coming to you in your divorce. I'm coming to you in all the things that are going on in your life. I am connecting to you. And the world may not understand. They're going to say, how in the world is he eating with tax collectors and sinners? Publicans. And God says, they may not understand, but guess what? Every single tongue will confess one day that though you didn't understand anything that he did, one day every one of you are going to know that what he did was right. Every one of us. Now, here's what he said. Listen, 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 listen. Paul said, you need to think the thinking of Jesus to get back to business. That means that you need to understand as a believer, you're a believer. You're good. We can't change that. That there's going to be some things that you'll have to step into that you're like, this doesn't uh, feel like a believer. That's all right. It feels like flesh. But you can, listen, listen to what it says. You can do everything that Jesus did without sin. Without sin. Now, we have the opinion that, well, if you go out there in the world, you know, they'll drag you down. I have the opinion that he that is in me is greater than he that is in this world. That's my opinion. That's what the Bible says. I don't think the world can drag me down. I think Jesus can lift them up. And, and we got to think like that. If Jesus thought, boy, I'll tell you what, I can see God thought, Jesus, I'm really worried about you because you're going into a sick world. And if you go in that sick world, they're going to pull you down. Jesus said, no, I'm going to raise them up. You can't pull me down because he that is in me is greater than he that is in the world. And by the way, I did not receive a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So we're, we're going to be okay in that. we got to take that mind on. That now, as we go into the ministry and we start doing things in ministry, guess who's going to get mad? Religious people. <laughs> That's, all right. That's all right. They'll get mad. But here's the deal. We've got to make sure that we're right with God and we're doing the right thing and we're trying to reach people. And as we do, one day God says, you're not going to get it down here, so quit looking for it. Quit looking for your affirmation down here. You probably get crucified down here. But one day, in heaven... I'll lift you up too. 
And people will understand that's what it's all about. Okay, now, how do we put that in shoe leather? How do we make sure that we can get that into shoe leather? Now, let me share some things that we're uh, attempting to do here. Easter's coming up in a couple of weeks. We've been asking for like 100 folks to be saved. And I already told you, we've had a couple this morning said, I want to be number one. I want to be number two. Number one was hard. i got to be honest with you. He came in here and this morning, 8 o'clock, and he's like, I'm coming here and I've been in church for a long time and I don't like church and I hate church and church people are crazy and y'all legalistic. And, and, and he was really nice though, but he was just really be sharing. He was really sharing. I said, that's okay. That's perfectly fine. Brother, you can come all you want to, and if I could pray with you, help you. He's like, no, you can't really help me. I just want to tell you, go tell your student pastor. I talked to him last week that I come back, and I'm here, and I honored what I said I was going to do, but I ain't ready yet. So I'm like, okay, that's fine. Hey, we'll help you any way we can. And then he came back in the guest reception. He's like, uh, could I get some of that food over there? Yeah, eat all you want to. Eat all the food you want to. So he left, and I came back in here for the 930 service. And he came on, he said, I can't leave. Get me somebody. So I came down here and I got Mike Morley. Mike Morley took him out the back, led him to Jesus. He was hanging around in the 11 o'clock hour. He was over there waiting on me. He said, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for what? He said, you know, do you know that salvation is easy? No. Really? He said, man, I kept thinking. He said, I was waiting for the skies to part. And Mike told me, skies won't part, but your soul will be saved. He said, I can't explain it, but man, I asked Jesus to save me. And I, I didn't even have to tell you, but... I feel different. I'm like, yeah, I bet you do because Jesus is in you. And then he was like, he had a smile on his face. I will see you next week. And I was like, I will hope to see you next week. And at the last hour, a lady came walking down. And we got, I kind of let the invitation go for another minute. And she came walking down, tears in her eyes, had two little babies with her. And she said, I just want to be number two. Is that all right? I'm like, yes, that's all right. That's all right. Listen. Here's what we want to do. Here's a couple things I want to do for next week and for Easter especially. Well, the first thing I want us to do is to learn to embrace our limitations. I don't know if you know this or not, but this church has a lot of limitations, especially from a facility standpoint. Our facilities are quite challenging. I've been here for 19 years, and I'm not sure I know where everything's at. I have gone around to places, and someone showed me something like, how long has that been there? Uh, 40 years. Oh, I didn't even know it was there. I didn't even know we had it. And our, our facilities are kind of spread out a little bit, and we use about every ounce of them, so we don't have a lot of space. And we're always challenged, especially after service, for me to greet our guests and hopefully to share with people about Jesus. And many times whenever we go over there, if you've been there, you know that there's a line. And I can tell that some folks get a little antsy waiting on me, and I, I wish I could do better, but I understand that. And so here's what we're going to do. Since we don't have any more facility left, we're going to put an outdoor structure right over here in front of our guest reception. Now, we don't want to spend a lot of money because we're limited with money and we're limited with space, okay? So this outdoor structure is also known under another name. It's a tent. <laughs> now, lest you get worried, <laughs> it's not a lot different than what we're in right now. It's just a little smaller, okay? It's going to be red, blood red, because that's one of our colors. And it's going to be right over here. It's going to be 15 feet long, wide, and 30 feet long. It's got walls on it, and it's going to be made so that after service, folks can go in there, and there's going to be a whole crew of people in there to help them either know Jesus or to pray with them or whatever the needs are that somebody has. That's going to afford us a bit of a change in our invitation because sometimes down here, I don't know if you ever had a million eyes looking at you, but it's a little scary for people to walk down here. And, and, and what we're going to do in our invitation, if a person wants to know Christ or something, we're going to dismiss them and they can go right out there at the tent where there'll be a whole group of people out there individually, one-on-one, -on -one, ready there to help those people. I know the first thought may come, well, what about a public profession of faith? Let's be scriptural and let's be biblical. Our public profession of faith is our baptism. It is not where you get saved. It is your baptism. It is coming before the people and identifying with Jesus through the waters of baptism. And we will always do that there. But if we can help folks to go that way and have many people out there where they don't have to worry about waiting on me in line and stuff like that, we're going to start that. We're going to do a dry run of it next week. Because our facilities are so kind of convoluted in how they figured out, most of you don't know where anything's at, and sometimes I still get lost out here. We're creating an entirely new ministry that is going to be in guests. There's going to be a tent out here, a 10 by 10, known as guest services. Now, we're going to call it for guest services because that's where we're going to do Guest services. See how that works? So we're going to, instead of putting a weird name that churches always have weird names, right? Where do I go to Sunday school? Dorcas class. You calling me a dork? 
No, that's just a lady in the Bible. So we decided to call things what they are. So it's going to be guest services. And at guest services, when somebody pulls on the lot that's a guest, we're going to have people there to help them find their way wherever they need to find in this property. Whether it's take their kids, bring you in here, take you back to the Life Center, uh, go for your students, or whatever it happens to be, we're creating a ministry where we help people find their way around here. And we're going to do a dry run of that next week because we really need this working on Easter Sunday morning. And, and we hope that some of the, just a couple of these little changes will allow people to better connect. One of the great challenges we struggle with is because our services are close together and time becomes a crunch. Sometimes at the invitation, folks feel a little bit like, ah, they're getting ready to close the service and stuff like that. So we're going to alleviate that by sending you over there to the red tent. And I can just say the red tent because it's a red tent. And you won't be able to miss it because it's red. Okay? And our goal is just to better connect. And, but now we're going to have to have this mind. We're going to have to have this mind. Doesn't change who we are. I can have a change of appearance without a change of identity. It doesn't change who we are. It just changes a couple of methodologies to better connect with somebody out there that so desperately needs us. I want to think about the whole body, but we're in position number two, and the lost are in position number one. We need to meet their needs on this morning as much as possible because it may be the only time they ever come through here. And we need to do everything we can to help them meet Jesus. And then let's celebrate with them. We've already had two. If I could say it like Billy Graham, who shall be next? Who's the next to come? Which one of you needs Jesus? Because can I tell you something? He made a conscious decision to leave heaven for you. He made a conscious decision to take on human flesh and to be tempted in every way you and I are tempted for you. He eliminated religion and established relationship and went to the cross to die for you. And God will highly exalt him one day to say not only that what Jesus did, I'm approving, but the people that Jesus went and got, I wanted. I wanted. I love you. I wanted. If that's you this morning and you've never been able to sense that kind of love, that's the kind of love that Jesus has for you. And I pray that you'll give your heart to him this morning. Would you stand with me? Father, in Christ's name, it's wonderful to be in your house today. What I think is more wonderful is the unity that I feel in this crowd. The desire to not simply give ourselves up because that's not what you ask us to do to still embrace our own identity, our love for you, this church. But Father, to also be able to realize that we have such an opportunity for reach to our world. We're limited here with a lot of things. We can't really go build another facility or something like that. It's too expensive right now. And so if a tent will suffice to keep the rain off and the sun away, we can set it up so that we would have a greater opportunity to sit down and truly minister to those who come here and really help them and spend time with them with answering their questions, maybe helping them find their way. Then Lord, help us to embrace that because it doesn't damage who we are. I ask you, Father, that in this hour, that there'd be somebody here that really wants to be number three and number four and number five, and so forth and so on. Because you love them, and so do we. Lord, we have to start thinking this way if we're going to reach. We don't have to think this way, but our reach will be greatly hindered. So help us. Please help us. Father, right now, if there are those who need Jesus or need prayer, may they come to the altars and we'll help them. In Christ's name. Amen.